everyone, and thank you so much for joining me here today. If you're new, I'm Amanda, and on this channel, we talk a lot about bridging the gap between mental and physical health. And I have a special guest today. He's the former president of WCW, the former general manager of WWE, the podcast host of 83 Weeks with Eric Bischoff, but most importantly, my first crush. Ladies and gentlemen, Eric Bischoff, thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you, Amanda. It's great to see you again. You too. And I, f I forgot to mention, you know, stand-in dad at my wedding. You're like my dad 2.0. <laughs> hey, I'm, I was happy to do it. I was honored to do it. That was such an awesome experience. I, I, I don't think I could ever say thank you enough for that. It just giving me faith in humanity again. Well, the good news is you don't have to say thank you again. <laughs> it's all good. When I was growing up with my dad, a lot of people gave so much flack to wrestling about how it perpetuated violence and it just taught people how to, uh, to respond aggressively to situations. But that wasn't the message I got at all. I, for me, it was about loyalty, you know, and about knowing the difference between good and bad. What do you think really the underlying messages of wrestling really is? I, I don't think there is any intentional underlying messages. I don't think the people that have been producing wrestling for television for since the beginning of television time necessarily go about it by contemplating a message or a statement. Um, I think wrestling, like so many forms of entertainment, is just really about good versus evil, which has been kind of the foundation for storytelling since, you know, People were drawing pictures of animals on caves you know, and representing the hunt and the harvest, you know, for thousands of years ago. So I think, you know, the struggle between good and evil, the journey between, you know, those who are, you know, immersed in good and evil and its outcomes have been the underlying premise of probably every major story known to man in one way, shape, or form. So I don't think there's anything unique about wrestling. I think people have a tendency to read into it, whatever their respective ideologies yeah. motivate them to, and you can find good and you can find bad and you can find questionable things. But you know, wrestling has always been, to an extent, uh, an extension and almost a parody of our culture. Yeah, I can definitely see that because I, I, I see how much it's changed over the years. You know, back when I was watching it and you were super active back in the 90s, it seemed like the messages and the, the, the culture was so much different back then than it is now and how the whole world's gone completely mad. <laughs> it's a lot different now. Uh, how do you think really the message has changed for you, like your, the personal, your personal take on it? I don't think the message has changed for me. I mean, I think the world has definitely gotten more complex more volatile um, over the last 10 or 15 or 20 years. One could perhaps subscribe that to the, the growth in social media and the dependence upon social media by so many people to fill the void that personal relationships used to have. Yeah. Um, I think people are so um, easily influenced by, you know, what they, what they read and what they hear on their, you know, personal <laughs> MCDs, mind control devices, because that's what these phones and Facebook and Twitter and, and Instagram and, and Reddit and so many of you know, the, the social platforms that exist today have really been taken over by people trying to influence others to believe the same way they do. And once you become dependent upon that, not only for your human interaction and your social interactions, but when you start depending on that presentation that you happen to read uh, wherever you happen to live in social media, it begins to shape your outlook on life. And so much of it is wrong. So much of it is intentionally designed to manipulate people, to divide people. Um, I'm, I'm much more fearful today of the news than I am of professional wrestling or any other form of content that people ascribe, you know, certain um, fundamental weaknesses in, I mean, look at gone for the wind or gone with the wind, you know, which is probably still to this day, you know, adjusting for economic realities, one of the top grossing movies of all time. Well, now it's racist. Now you can't watch it unless somebody tells you how you should feel about watching yeah. it. 
I think that's really dangerous. I think people are smart enough to realize as a society, we've certainly evolved since the 30s or the 40s and the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, and we'll continue to evolve. But to attack certain forms of media as the source of all evil, evil or the certain types of entertainment as the source of all evil, all the while, you know, fueling the fires of social media discord and mayhem, that's okay. Yeah. But God forbid we watch a cartoon about a police dog. I mean, come on. It's crazy. You have an excellent point because I think nowadays, not only does everybody have to have their opinion, but they have to shove their opinion on everyone else. And they have to let you know that their opinion is the only right opinion to have. And I didn't see that back in the 90s as much. Maybe I was young, maybe I was naive, but I didn't see that back in the 90s. People were more open then than they are now. And we're trying to say that we have all of these problems. I almost think that these problems are being self-created more well, by are. society and the reaction to whatever media form you're watching, be it wrestling or you know the news or whatever. I think people are attaching their own narrative to these things and then expecting everyone else to agree with that narrative. And, and here's the worst part. If let's say I, I see something that I don't agree with. Now I I'm very careful on social media because I'm high enough profile that if I say the wrong thing, or even if I say, if my intent was to say the right thing and perhaps I worded it in a way and because you know, social media has no tone. You know, there's no facial expressions. There's no body language that comes with it. So I can say something that perhaps in my own way, I'm trying to say with just a hint of humor while making a point, someone else could read that, not recognize the humor or the intent and completely twist or turn what I say and make it seem like I'm a person that I'm not. Or in, in worse yet, encourage others to turn against me and cancel me or shadow ban me or, you know, call me, you know, characterize me as, as things that I'm not. It's become such a violent and volatile world, social media, that, you know, other than promoting really positive things, um, I, I stay away from it. It's too treacherous. People are too eager to not only express their opinion, but attack people who, who don't agree with that opinion. And we've now gotten to the point I've noticed over the last week or two, if you happen to be someone who prefers not to engage because of the toxicity and in, in, in just the nature and the darkness that social media represents and at every level, if you choose not to engage, well, then you're stigmatized as someone who doesn't care. Yeah, and or, that's really or, or, bothered me because I can't handle being all over social media all the time, especially with all this going on in the news. It just, it gives me anxiety to think about things if there's nothing I can do about them. But then if I, like you said, choose to just say, okay, well, you know, if, if there's something I can do, I will do that, but I'm not going to put a black picture on my profile and go on and on about how the president's terrible and everybody's terrible and everybody's feeling because that's not making any positive difference in the movement itself or otherwise, you know? No, and it's, it, it, and it's unfortunate. And I try not to um, think too much or, or allow my mind to wander and pay attention to conspiracy type theories or, you know, the, the, the dark underworld of political machinations, because it's just, it's a rabbit hole that once I think you go down that hole, there's a chance you may never come out. Yeah. And so I, I, I stay away from that. But I'm also a person, you know, I'm 65 years old. I've lived through a lot of stupid shit. You know, I, I grew up in Detroit. I was living in Detroit as a kid during the 1968 riots. I was 13 years old. I remember them vividly. Wow. I, re I remember moments and incidents in my life back then. Uh, and I live, you know, at 10 Mile and Gratiot, only two miles away from Eight Mile uh, in, the, in, in, in the movie and the song that, that Eminem made famous. Uh, we actually went to the same uh, elementary school at different times. Oh my God, that's crazy. At the same, to the same elementary school. But, you know, I've seen unrest. I lived not only through the 68 riots in Detroit, but, you know, I was pretty young, you know, during the Vietnam protests, but old enough to really pay attention and understand all the way through high school, up until my senior year in high school, actually. Um, and that was a very, you know, that was a dark time in our history. You know, the civil rights protests in the 60s, while I was too young to really understand it, very well aware of it. But I, I don't think there's ever been a time like this. And again, I'm not blaming the world's 
ills on social media. I think it goes much deeper than that. I think as a culture and a society and as human beings, we've lost our way so much that we have now become so reliant on hate. You know, I, I, that it's, it, it, it scares me because hate is starting to control things. You know, I, I tweet, the one thing I did tweet when I was really struggling about a week ago, um, I, I wanted to share how I felt, but I was trying to find a way to do it that was non offensive, regardless of however you feel. If you feel very strongly on either side of any issue, I, I try to find a intelligent, articulate way to share how I feel without alienating anybody. And that's really hard to do, by the way. Yeah. But one of the things that I thought about, you know, one morning I was sitting out on the deck with my dog drinking coffee and, you know, it, it, it occurred to me that, you know, ignorance, the literal term, you know, the literal definition of ignorance, you know, lack of knowledge, um, ignorance creates fear. I think that's a human condition. We're always afraid of things that we don't understand or things that we don't know or things we haven't been exposed to before. I think that's probably at its core one of the reasons human beings have been able to survive as long as we have successfully on the on this earth. We have critical thinking and judgment. But I, I think we've gotten to the point where ignorance, things that we're, we don't understand or we're not knowledgeable in or comfortable with or used to, that creates fear, which in a way can be healthy because if you're afraid of something and you're rational, you'll do research. Yeah. You'll get to know whatever it is you're afraid of. You'll confront it in a healthy way. But if you don't have the tools or you haven't been brought up in a way um, that allows you to recognize fear for what it is and not allow it to turn to hate. And I think that's where we've fallen down, especially over the last 10 or 15 years. And I think social media has a lot to do with it. We've gotten to the point now where ignorance creates fear and, and fear automatically almost in, in the blink of an eye creates hate and, and hate has become a commodity. Politicians use it on both sides, all sides. They all use it. They all use fear. Fear is really a commodity. The news media exist, wouldn't exist today without creating fear and stoking fear that forces the you know, people to feel like they have to be more reliant on the source of their information and news in order to keep up to date and help them prepare or to have an opinion in case someone asks them or guide them in how to tweet the correct social media messages or imagery. It's, it's really unhealthy. And I, and I, I think about that every day, you know, anytime that I, I find myself being and fear takes on different forms, you know, fear isn't always, Oh my God, it's yeah, not, no. it's not shock and awe all the time. Sometimes fear is insidious. You know, it works its way into your, your, your subconscious. And before you know it, it becomes part of your conscious thinking and your reaction to fear becomes something that you're not paying attention to. But when I find something that, that scares me, if it's a new piece of information, for example, um, I recognize that, wow, that's, that's something I don't know about. That's kind of a scary headline. I'm going to do some research. And that eliminates a lot of that fear or concern. Imagine if everyone did that right now. Imagine if when you saw something on social media that really triggered that fear or that emotion, you really found the source of it to see the truth. Imagine what a change that in of itself would make for all of the fear and all of the hate mongering that's going on. Cause it makes me sad that you're saying, you know, you have to sit and contemplate for all this time just before making a simple post on social media, because you don't want your fans to think less of you. You don't want, you know, people to think that you're someone you're not. And having known you just in the time that I have, that makes me sad because I know your heart. I know that you would never make racist tweets or whatever, but I also know that, you say one slight thing that someone disagrees with and it's going to be all over the news that now Eric Bischoff's a racist and he hates puppies and, you know, people take things to the absolute extreme now. And just for a headline, just for clickbait, that's, that's really all it's become is where's the next headline? Where's the next, uh, where's the next piece of fear that we can jump on to, to get people on our side. And that to me is utterly terrifying. I agree with you. And you know, through the years, even when I was a kid, you've always been such a role model to me for perseverance, just from your backstory that, you know, you climbed the ranks in wrestling and you dealt with 
criticism over the years. You dealt with, you know, people not liking you based on your decisions. And then of course, when you turned heel and you joined NWO back in the early nineties and I wasn't allowed to crush on you anymore. And I was sad. <laughs> I had to have my hidden little Eric Bischoff poster. And, but, but that has to be hard, you know, to have people dislike you like that or have people judge you like that. How did you deal with that criticism? Cause I think that could be an important lesson for people to learn how to cope with those feelings. You know, I mean, that's a really, really good question. And if I, if I allow, if I allow myself to think about it in depth, I realize that while I was doing it, while I was playing the character of the evil boss, Eric Bischoff, and I was working very hard to get people to dislike me because that was my character on television. I was playing the bad guy. I was the antagonist to everybody else's protagonist. That was my role as a performer. No different than an actor in a movie who plays, you know, an evil character um, or, or in a book or in a television series. It was no different. But the, the difference for me was that, you know, I wasn't an actor playing a fictional character named, you know, Joe Blow. My name was Eric Bischoff and, I, and, and I, my character's name as, as, a, as a bad guy on television was named Eric Bischoff. My real job was president of WCW, but my role on television, I was using my, my position as president of WCW, which is the truth, to shape the way we were telling our stories. And those lines became very blurry for people. When you go to a movie, and, and if you were to see Denzel Washington, for, for example, he's one of my favorite actors, but if you that's why I picked him. If you go to a movie and you see Denzel Washington, you know, a lot of Denzel's most successful movies was he was the protagonist you know he was the good guy he was the hero cop he's done some movies where he wasn't quite the good guy but with Denzel Washington once he walks away from that role and once the movie comes out when people see him in the street they don't think that Denzel Washington is actually the guy in the movie right, right? but in, in wrestling, because wrestling always blurs the lines between reality and fiction anyway, um, and because I played a role of a bad guy using my real name and my real position in a fictional storyline way, that made that confusion even more um, palpable. And it wasn't until after I walked away from it that I realized, you know, just how treacherous that was for me to, to play the role, to play myself being the role of a bad guy really, really embedded itself in a lot of people's opinions of me. And for a long time after I got out of wrestling, you know, I, it didn't bother me, you know, like I didn't feel bad about it. I didn't cry about it and, you know, argue about it or, you know, complain about it. It was just a real, you know, vivid reality in my life. And it hasn't been until the last couple of years that that audience who was still, you know, in their 18s or maybe younger in your case, but in their teens and 20s and 30s who got sucked into the character of Bischoff were now finally realizing, oh, he wasn't that guy. I used to love, now the feedback that I get is, oh man, I used to love to hate you. I used to throw things at the television. I would get in fights with my friends because we would argue over, you know, whether you were the good guy or the bad guy. Well, good. That's what I was trying to do. But now finally they've matured enough to the point where they go, oh yeah, I used to hate that guy, but now I now I realize that I love to hate him, but it's, it's tricky. You know, it's, it's really tricky. And how you deal with that is, is, is tricky. I, you know, fortunately, you know, my wife, you know, Lori has really helped me, you know, through that. Some of it is just, you know, growing through it and getting through it. You kind of figure shit out on your own, but it's, uh, you know, having people throw stones at you and criticize you and, and things like that. It's, it's tough to take. I can't imagine being, a school teacher or, or social worker, a cop, politician, you know, anybody that's out there, you know, exposed to the public runs the risk of, of being characterized as something that you're not. And you have to be able to deal with that. And that is really rough. I mean, I think a lot of people, whether in the public eye or not, deal with, you know, the character that other people make of them. I know I let that define me for a really long time. And, 
I imagine that having somebody like Lori, you guys have literally been together longer than I've been alive. So that says something. And I imagine having someone like that in your life, just someone that supported you and could help you stay grounded and help you, you know, remember your real character who's a real Eric Bischoff was, was probably pretty helpful. Yeah. Oh, it was very helpful. And it was, I'm sure for Lori, it was, you know, that's something that you could probably talk to her about. I'm sure from my perspective, that's been more challenging at times than others because there's been times in my life in my life where I was so consumed, you know, just with the day-to-day process of, you know, running a yeah. re- international wrestling company and, and, and all the things that came with it that I was kind of like caught up in my own little world and probably not paying as close of attention as I should to, to things around me and people around me. Um, and there's been times when it's been easier for her to kind of guide me through this nonsense. But uh, the, 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 the common, you know, thread through all of it is that we've been together all this time and she knows you know she knows when it's time to kind of get in my face and do a little correction and and she knows i've only known her for a few years (laughs) and and, and she's she's very artful at knowing when to back off because she's pretty sure i'm going to figure it out on my own and sometimes figuring it out on my own is a little easier in the long run than having to be led by the nose to the you know right to the right pool of water, so to speak. So it's, it's been an interesting challenge for her, I'm sure. Right. As, as the chick in that situation, yeah, sometimes it can be kind of challenging, but anybody that knows you guys, you guys are relationship goals. You guys are what everybody probably aspires to be. Do you really have any advice for how you guys stayed connected, especially with, you know, your long days and the the travels that you did during, during the time of of the, the Monday night wars when you were gone, probably quite a bit. How did you guys stay so strong and connected through all that. I think, you know, we, we started out like, I mean, we're not special in any respect in, in terms of the way we met and how we started out and the things that we went through as a young couple. And, you know, Lori becoming, you know, pregnant before she got married, before we got married when she was only 22 years old. And, you know, there was a lot of things and challenges that we've gone through that are no different and maybe not nearly um, as challenging as, as things that other people have gone through. But we, we did have our own. To us, they were big challenges at the time. Um, we didn't compare our challenges to other people's challenges. To us, they were like major challenges and we had to deal with them. And I think, you know, one of the consistent things, and again, I'll probably say that word more than once, consistent thread or consistent things in our relationship is that no matter how bad things were at any given point, there were times, I mean, that when, we were so broke right after uh, Garrett was born and even, you know, shortly thereafter Montana was born um, that we were so broke, we were bouncing checks in order to buy diapers. You know, they were repossessing our cars out of our driveway because we, we had no money to pay our bills. We lived in a very cold climate in Minnesota, a, a little town called Prior Lake, just south of Minneapolis, where in January, it typically goes down to 15, 20, 30 degrees below zero. And our home was heated with propane, which had to be, it wasn't city heat, you know, city gas or anything like that. We had to have a truck come out and fill a propane tank up with propane. Well, we couldn't afford the propane. So, you know, the next best thing I could do was find a bunch of little camping lanterns that burned on kerosene, bounce a couple of checks for them and bounce enough checks to buy kerosene to heat our house, which by the way is really dangerous. So we, we've gone through periods of time like that, but one of the things that we always did was make sure that on Friday nights we had a date night. And sometimes a date night was, would be just going to a, a, a movie that we could afford. Sometimes it would just be going out for a drink or two or a bite to eat, even though we probably shouldn't have afforded it. We found a way to afford it. And we allowed ourselves to be a couple. We, we, we called it dating. We continued dating. We still do. Um, our dating kind of changed a little bit. You know, it's not as much fun probably to the outside world as it used to be, but. Especially during a global pandemic. <laughs> Yeah. Well, but I mean, the things that we enjoy doing together now are different than the things that we enjoyed doing together when we were in our 20s and our 30s or even our 40s. Um, we we, we t- tend to stay closer to home. We tend to do things outdoors. We, we tend to go places and see things that um, are, are important to us as opposed to just going out for a night of socializing and, and having fun with friends. But we've always had that. It's always been consistent. And I think as long as you can keep dating, 
even if it's only one day a week or two and treat yourself like you're dating. Uh, I hate to use the word courting because that makes me sound older than I already am. I still use courting too, so don't feel bad. <laughs> okay. But you know, there's that, there's that energy. There's that way of relating to each other when you're in that phase of your relationship where you're still exploring new things and, you know, discovering fun things about each other and being able to maintain that, you know, throughout your relationship, I think is really important, but you know, Lori's perfect for that for me. Um, she's always seen and understood, even if she didn't intellectually understand it, she probably does more now because she studied it for so long, but she's always been the type of person that, that put a value on keeping a relationship a relationship and not allowing it to become a business relationship or not allowing it to become an adversarial relationship because you have such you know diametrically opposed views on any whether it's budgets or whatever else it is raising how you raise your kids or how you relate to family members or all there's a million things that can or the support. wrestlers you support yeah so it's I I I I attribute it all to Lori. <laughs> <laughs> Did I tell you that my best friend and I actually met because she was a big NWO supporter and obviously I couldn't like NWO because I was the, the goody good girl and we ended up getting this huge fight in the middle of English class and I hated her guts to the end of days until I realized that she really had just done this because she liked watching me get all impassioned about now oh, NWO is terrible and I hate them and they suck and we ended up becoming best friends. This happened in seventh grade. We ended up becoming best friends because and see, there, and, and see, there's a lesson in there. So next time somebody trolls you on social media, right? remind yourself of that girl in English class and just know that they're really only doing it because they have fun watching you react. Yes. Maybe you could end up being friends if you got to know each other. And I will say, as a person that in my 20s, I did a lot of volunteer work. Some of it was very controversial, like with Planned Parenthood and stuff, uh, that I, I really supported that organization at the time. And I loved nothing more than ruffling the feathers of the protesters just to get them all riled up because I was sitting out there, I was bored, I had nothing else to do. And it was so much fun to watch these people get so riled up at the time. And obviously, I grew out of that in a, in a lot of ways. But I, I think that people do, they're almost addicted to the drama that they stir up on social media. And one of the things I learned as an adult, I think the best adult lesson I ever learned was there is nothing of freaking value in a comment section, ever. You are never going to change someone's mind in a comment section on social media, you know? No, and I, that's another thing that I've really, you know, and, and I think the last couple of months, you know, between the COVID pandemic and, and now what we're going through, um, because of the George Floyd incident in Minneapolis and as horrific as that was. And now the fallout from all of that is every time I told this to my son the other day, uh, our son, um, you know, every time I find myself reaching for my, and I, all my stuff, I, I do it all here. You know, I don't spend a lot of time on, on my desktop unless I'm working, but um, every time I find myself going, yeah, but that's not true. I'm going to tell them how I no, don't. It's not going to do a damn bit of good. It's not going to do any good. And all it's going to do is create more of the kind of negative, I hate to sound like, you know, an 80s hippie or 70s hippie, but it just create. it just adds to the negative vibe. You're just, cre you're, you're, you're stirring more shit is yeah. all you're really doing. And the harder you steer it, the worse it becomes. Or and the worse, really, I mean, it, it, it detracts from the reason people are so upset in the first place. The reason people are upset is because this man got killed and it was unjustified. We can all agree on that. But then now you're adding all this drama and all this hatred, which is detracting from that. And in no way are you honoring or trying to move this process or this, this movement forward, in my opinion, at least. I'm more cynical than you are. <laughs> and, and, I, and I want to take the George Floyd um, incident. I hate to call it an incident because that kind of diminishes it in a way. And, and I don't mean to do that at all. When I saw that go, you know, I grew up in Minneapolis, right? I mean, I didn't grow up there, but I lived there for about 20 years. I know Minneapolis fairly well. When I saw that, and, and I've seen a lot of negative stuff. Like I said, I, I, I remember vividly when, you know, the riots went down in Detroit and martial law was, you know, the rule of the day and the tanks were driving down the streets and the army and the national guard were everywhere. I, I remember that. I remember seeing people getting shot while they're looting stores. I remember seeing tanks rolling down the street and leveling, you know, the barrel of the tank, you know, on a building and, you know, giving people a warning. And if they didn't come out, they would just level the building. I mean, I've, I've seen it with my own eyes. So it's not like I'm, 
naive in any respect. Um, but when I saw that cop, that individual, he's not a cop. He just, he was masquerading as one. But when I saw that individual kill George Floyd, he murdered him. Um, I couldn't watch it. There's very little that makes me go, that makes me turn away. And it is literally physically revolting to me. Like so much so that I, I have to look away because I can feel myself starting to physically react to it. That was one of those incidents where when I watched that, the first time I saw it, I don't think I really watched it through until about two weeks afterwards or a week afterwards. I just couldn't get myself to do it. But, but that's an example of what I meant earlier. That individual, that fake cop, if you will, who happened to be, still be carrying a badge, was so ignorant that his ignorance became a fear which became rage and hatred and it manifested itself on, on, on a street in Minneapolis. It was ignorance that caused that. It was hatred that caused that. And now what we're watching and witnessing are all of law enforcement being thrown into that same bucket. That's uh, just so not right. And it's so dangerous. Now we've seen an incident where people came together to your initial point. Everybody agreed. Republicans, Democrats, independents, whites, blacks, Hispanics, Native Americans, Asians. There's nobody that stood up and went, yeah, but maybe, maybe there's another side to this story. Nobody uh, said that. Not that I heard. But what's happened now because hate has become a commodity. The news media needs hate in order to create fear or to feed fear. It's a symbiotic relationship. The news media needs it, and they need it to keep people hooked and to keep watching their shit. And what's happened is now you've got, not only do we have a racial issue that's probably more significant now than it has been since the 60s, really. Um, we've got police departments that are becoming divided. You've got not only Republicans, Republicans and Democrats divided, that's, that, that train left the station a long time ago, but now we're seeing indications that even the military is becoming divided and taking sides and taking positions publicly, which I think is really, really dangerous because I think it's the precursor for something much more significant and, and potentially dangerous for our culture and our, our country. As, and as I keep seeing these divisions growing and kind of like a tree root branching out and attacking other very critical parts of our society, it's really getting frightening. It's, 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 it's amazing. And I, and I, I just think it, it starts with ignorance. It, 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 it's exacerbated by people's dependence on this. It, it's compounded by people's ignorance because nobody wants to learn anything or read anything or develop an opinion based on a bunch of different source material. Everybody wants to read a headline and take a position. And those headlines are misleading. Those headlines are designed to create fear because fear creates hate and hate has become a commodity. I think in a way we've almost created the character, character that we talked about in the beginning, like Eric Bischoff was the bad guy and everybody needed to see Eric Bischoff as the bad guy. That's just what they had to do. And I think now we're almost creating that culturally that, well, now this person has to be the bad guy and that's just the way it is. And if you say otherwise, then you're wrong and I hate you. And now you're just perpetuating more hatred, as you said, through this ignorance of not being able to understand that that person is still a person. And in most cases, they're trying to, you know, formulate an opinion based on the information that they have. And if we would be more open to receiving more information, to learning more and truly growing, that's probably where we'd start moving forward, not only on these issues like equality, but as a society, that's where we'd really start moving forward, I think. I hope so. You know, I hope so. And, 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 and I, I, I probably, you know, wish in, in a small way that I was more active 
you know, because I'd like to contribute more at this stage in my life. I think of, okay, what's my, I don't use the word legacy much, but you know, how am I going to be remembered by friends and family or people that maybe are, are, are outside of the friends and family spectrum, just because I've had a few minutes of, of celebrity, well, you know, what did I do with that? You know, and I, I think at this point, and, and it goes to, again, why I don't make too many positions in social media. Um, I would much rather try to convince people that perhaps my way of approaching life is it worth something to, is at least something to, to consider by my actions, because I can control my actions. I can control how I make some lady at Walmart standing in line in front of me. I can control how I make her feel. And if by being kind or, or going out of my way to be a little extra courteous or doing something that's so remotely in, 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 and so insignificant, but is a kindness. Um, I think that'll probably have more influence on people than me, you know, getting on my freaking social media and joining the cesspool of toxic commentary that um, everybody else is engaged in. I know what I can do. And if I live my life right, you know, I have friends of all races and in many religions. Um, and by embracing my friends of different races and religions and cultures, um, maybe that's an example. And that's something that I can be in control over. How people react to what I say on social media, I'm not in control of that. So I'd rather take charge of the things I am control of, in control of and utilize those tools as opposed to joining the cesspool of toxic commentary that social media provides. It's interesting that you mentioned the legacy thing because we all want to leave our mark in the world, right? We all want to have some kind of positive effect. I, I believe that most people want to leave the world a better place than they found it. And some of them might not go around it in the right way. And most of us do not have, you know, celebrity standing, but like you, you, you wonder what mark am I going to leave on the world and how can I make this huge impact? And even if right now you never did another thing in the spotlight and you never, donated a bunch of money to charity like you are the reason that i had a bond with my dad like your the your legacy is the only reason that me and my dad really bonded as a child so we never really know the impact that we have on people maybe that we didn't even meet maybe that we met briefly maybe that lady that you met at walmart because you smiled at her and you were kind to her maybe she had a little bit more hope in humanity that day you know we don't we don't really know the impacts we have on people through our words, through the social media posts that we make. Maybe we left a message at the wrong time and that really just pushed someone over the edge that day. I, I think that being mindful of the impact we have is powerful, but knowing that even if we don't have the celebrity status, you know, even if we don't have a lot of money, we can still make a huge difference in people's lives. Absolutely. And you know, you, you touched on a couple of important things there and you know, I've, I've told the story about how you and I met, you know, at a Comic-Con and, and when I was up on the stage with, with Hulk Hogan and Sting and you stood up way in the back, you know, in one of the last rows and you told me your story and it brought a tear to my eye then. And every time I tell that story, and if I'm not careful, it will now, it, it brings a tear to my eye. I hate Eric Bischoff cry, everyone. I just want to put that out there. <laughs> and, I, and, and I've told that story before, and I've used that as a shining example to others, um, people in the business like me, because you don't know. And, and while I've never heard a story that struck me as much as yours did, I can't tell you the number of times that I've gone to autograph signings or comic cons or events of whatever, whatever nature where I'm meeting the public. And I have people that are now in their twenties and thirties coming up to me and, and sharing similar stories. You know, I, I was one of the only things I could bond with my parents or my grandparents or my brother or my friends. It was that one thing that we had, or, you know, I was kind of an outcast in, in, in school and in junior high. And, you know, wrestling is the one thing that I watched that, you know, made me feel like there was hope for me, you know, because I identified with, you know, a character on television. Well, that's, you know, you don't know. And, 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 and to your point, that lady that I was kind to the other day in Walmart, she didn't know I was in the wrestling business. She could have cared less. 
She didn't go, oh, Eric Bischoff, the guy from wrestling, was really nice to me today, so I have hope. I was just a guy standing in line that, see, that could see that she was struggling a little bit, you know, handling her groceries. She was an older lady, and she needed a little bit of help. And it was just such a – at the time, it, it was a reflex. I didn't really think about it till afterwards. I thought, gosh, she, the way she looked at me and the, you know, I saw her just kind of lighten up. It's like, you know, you're right. You, you don't have to have a lot of money. You don't have to be a celebrity. In fact, it might be better if you're not because then people think you're doing it for another reason. But I, I think if you just take the time to look people in the eye when you talk to them, you know, that's another thing we don't do a lot of anymore because we don't have to. You know, now we all get to work from yeah, home, right? Yeah. So I'm so interested in what you have to say right now, like while we're playing on our phone and pretending that, the, that we're spending time with a friend. And I'm guilty of that too, by the way, Lori. Oh, and, and so is Lori too, by the way. She'll, she'll claim she's not. And whenever I point it out to her, you know, she goes, yeah, but you do it a lot more than I do, <laughs> which, is true, which is true. But we all do it. And it's, again, we all, we're all prone to become victims to these fucking absolutely needy, horrible devices that, you know, you just got to be careful that you don't let it take over your soul for crying out loud. And I think that's the bigger problem. That's what most people are doing is, is they just don't know how to find balance. You know, they don't know how to manage their social life with this new addiction that they have with God knows like what else is going on in their life. And I think that's a big part of, of being, you know, an influencer like, like you are, that there was a certain amount of balance that you had to have, you know, between your career and staying active and your family and uh, your fans and everything. And how, how do you really do that? I mean, what is the best way to try to find some kind of balance, especially when you feel like the whole world's going crazy outside your window? Well, I mean, it's different for me now, you know, because if I look outside of my window, I'm, you know, surrounded by mountains, Yellowstone National Park, I could hit it with a Frisbee from here on a good windy day. Um, you know, we're not experiencing the same things. You know, I just got off the phone right before this with a good friend of mine in New York City who's, you know, lives right down in, in, in Soho. And his life is completely different than my life right now. Um, and I, I understand that. But for, for me, it's easier now because I, I'm not forced to have to deal with it as much as I would be if I was living in New York or Chicago or LA. It's not in my face. My life is no really no different right now today than it was a year ago. It's just not. Um, but that's because of where I live. I live in a, the, the least populated state in the United States. There's only six people per square mile throughout the whole wow. state. You There's 500,000 500, people in the state of Wyoming. And the state of Wyoming is, you know, the size of Colorado, if not bigger. So it's, it's just not the same here as it is everywhere else. But, you know, going back to, to balance, you know, the one thing I think that I guess because of the way I grew up and just the way I've always thought about things, you know, my family has always been the most important thing to me. You know, nothing has taken a priority consistently over my family. There are times when, you know, I, I did things and, and, and immerse myself in my work or, or whatever else was required of me at the time. And it, it, it seemed out of balance and was out of balance for a while, but I knew that those were going to be short runs. It may be a couple of weeks. It may be a couple months. You know, once the kids were out of school, then all of a sudden the kids are traveling with me on location to go shoot TV shows you know, the kids and my wife. And oh, by the way, some of my kids' friends were coming along too. So it was like a little, you know, caravan, you know, from the neighborhood. And Our even though I was still working 16, <laughs> 16 or 18 hours a day, sometimes seven, six or seven days a week, my family was there and a part of it to, to, to the extent they could be. So there, there were always ways to kind of mitigate the challenges for us, but it all started with a commitment to keep the family first. I think that's something that gets lost in all this is people just lose sight of their priorities. They lose sight of what's the most important and they try to shove everything in all at once and fa they feel like they're failing at all of it because I mean, none of us not Because they've lost things. themselves. Yeah. Because they, what, what they've lost is the most important thing, which is what's important to you? What, where are your priorities? Don't let them get lost in all the things that, they, that, that it can get lost in because there's a lot. <laughs> 
you know, there's your job, your, you know, your pressure from friends and family and society in general, and the need to feel a part of something, whatever that something is. Sometimes those some things are very healthy. Sometimes those some things are very unhealthy, but we're driven by this need to be a part of a group. And we don't really kind of delineate between, is this a good healthy thing for me based on my priorities? Or is this just like, Oh, this sounds like fun. I'm jumping in. Or my friends are in this group. I'm going to jump in. That's the way I'm going to think. That's the way I'm going to behave. That's what I'm going to post on social media. Not because you really think that way, but because you feel that way. It's, right. it's, it's and you, and you feel that way. And this is going back to the media again, a while back a year and a half ago or so I did a, a TEDx talk. It's like a TED talk. And I talked about how the media doesn't want you to think. So the last thing they want you to do, they're not going to give you two sides of an equation and allow you to come up with your own answer. They're going to give you the side of the equation that they want to use to make you feel how they want you to feel. That's the problem. It, the news doesn't want you to think the news wants you to feel much like professional wrestling, professional wrestling. When we would write out professional wrestling, we didn't want you to think about it. Right. Crying out loud. If you thought about it too much, you'd realize how ridiculous it is. <laughs> right. But we did try really hard to make you feel because by manipulating your emotions and your reactions and playing in your emotional sandbox, we were able to extract the kind, of the, the, the kind of reactions that we wanted so that we could make money off that. It sounds horrible, but it's true. No, Guess what? what? That's so is the, the, yeah. and, and today's news media does the exact same thing. They don't want you to think. They want you to feel. And as long as they can make you feel, they can control you. I actually watched that TEDx talk and it was one of the most powerful TEDx talks I've ever seen. So I'm going to go ahead and link that down below guys, as well as the 83 weeks with Eric Bischoff podcast. Eric, thank you so much for coming on, being willing to talk to us today about all this. I want to end in kind of a flashback mode. So if you had to give a PSA like you did back in the NWO days, if you had to give a PSA to America right now, give us your, your, your 30 second PSA here for America. Wow, you're putting me on the spot, and, and without any chance to think about it, I'll just kind of make a derivative of what we just talked about. America, you were born with a mind. You were born with a soul. You were born with a heart. Use your brain. Do not believe anything that you read here. Do not believe it. Question it. Don't let anybody make you feel one way or the other. If they make you think and it encourages you, to, encourages you to read and to learn and to do your own research to, so that you can determine how you feel, that's perfect. But don't let this nonsense control how you think or how you feel because it's, it's, it's false. It's not true. You're being manipulated. Hey guys, I hope you loved that interview. If you did, make sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel for more celebrity interviews as well as other insights for bridging that gap between mental and physical health. Today, I have an extra special bonus for you. The day that Eric and I met was actually captured on film. So here is the question that I asked him and Sting so you get an extra bonus at the Ace Comic Con back in 2018. Enjoy! You no, know, I was her first crush. He was. He was she my told first me that, crush. She told me that earlier today. It made me feel so good. Um, gosh, now I forgot. Okay. So... She said the same thing to me. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> so um, in, in the height of WCW, when um, everything was really big, I was only like seven years old, and my parents were constantly defending their decision to watch wrestling because it is violent, but I felt I learned a lot about loyalty, and it gave me a good opportunity, like I had earlier, to bond with my dad. What lessons did you guys learn, like, through your time as a wrestler? Like, what lessons did you learn through being a professional? Uh, one of the things I learned is, is, you know, to try to treat everybody the way you'd like to be treated. And I'm not saying I treated everybody right, because I didn't. But I learned real quick that, you know, the person that you mistreat one day could be the person that you work for the next. In this wrestling industry, that's the way it works. I mean, to be quite honest, Eric. Eric was a good, good example of that. Was he your first crush, too? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> what are you doing later, Eric? I don't know, but we both like sushi. <laughs> Oh, this is not turning out the way I thought it was going to turn out. That escalated. Talk about taking risks and stepping out of the box. Where were we? Oh, you, you were talking about... Treating people well. Oh, yeah. What, 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 what did I learn? Yeah, I mean, it's just... Eric, Eric was, was somebody who one day was... I mean, how did you start? I, I got a call from Jim Hurd. Uh, to come in and audition because he wanted me to make Tony Schiavone and Jim Ross's life miserable. For some reason, he wanted me there to make them less secure in their job. That was, and he literally told me that. So I was the C squad, and I like I batted cleanup for the guy that batted cleanup as an announcer. He uh, he showed up. I mean, this this Ken perfect Ken doll, you know. Dark hair, about as handsome as they come, Mr. GQ, and, you know, just prim and pro proper with that microphone and putting it in my face and all the other wrestlers. And I thought, who, who is this? Why is he interviewing us? I mean, he had so much heat from the beginning, and he didn't do anything wrong. He just had heat from the beginning, you know. But he's a classic example because he ended up running the company. He ended up being, I mean, second in command under Ted Turner pretty much, you know. So. What about you, Eric? You know, I probably, it all happened to me so fast, to be really honest about it. Um, it, it it's, I never really caught up to the position I was in. And I think I've learned more now, after the fact, than I really did then. Because I was, it was like being in a, it was like being in a marathon, but it was a sprint pace for me. And now looking back, um, if I had it to do all over again, in terms of taking away what I've, wish I would have learned at the time was to be more patient with people and to be more open-minded. Um, not that I wasn't open-minded. Sometimes I was too open-minded and I listened to too many people and I tried to balance everybody's input and try to make the best out of it that I could. And that's not always the right decision either. But in general, I think I've learned to be more patient and be more open-minded. Thank you guys very much.